farm, target, tracking. Engage, fire it. Hello and welcome back everyone, it's Matt Smith, thank you for joining me on today's video. We're learning some more about air defense weapon systems today, and in particular, one that is kind of close to my heart because it comes from my home nation's military. Yes, today we are talking about the Rapier air defense weapons platform used by both the British Army and Royal Air Force RAF Regiment. Yes, this is quite the formidable anti-aircraft weapon system, although still dated, it is still able to do its job today. Most of you have probably been aware, coming from the UK, that this weapons platform is still being used today, and most notably in the past in the Olympics, for the Summer Olympics that were held in London. Yes, there was a lot of controversy with these, uh, you know, weapons platforms being located all over central London to try and protect against potential aircraft flying into, you know, large crowds of people, because people tend to not like that. Um, but I digress. We are going to go over the standard format for most of my videos. We'll go over this weapons platform's history, its specifications and finally my own opinion on what I feel about this weapons platform which to be honest is basically just going to be what I can see from the research and opinions that I take from that research. So let's talk a little bit about it shall we. So the Rapier is a British surfaced air missile developed for the Royal Air Force Regiment and the British Army in the Royal Artillery. Entering service in 1972 it eventually replaced all other anti-aircraft weapons in army service, guns for low altitude targets and the Thunderbird missile. It was used against longer range or higher altitude targets. It did replace the Bofors gun and the Tiger Cat missiles in the Royal Air Force Service. As the expected air threat moved from medium altitude strategic missions to low altitude strikes like close air support, the fast reaction time and high maneuverability of the Rapier made it more formidable than either of these weapons, replacing most of them by 1977. It remains in the UK's primary air defence weapons network after almost 35 years of service and its deployment is expected to continue until 2020. Now for me, this is a little concerning. When you have a platform that's been running for 35 years that has to be super technologically advanced to engage aircraft that are travelling a Mach 2 or 3, you know, whatever high speeds that fighter jets nowadays can, are capable of, it is worrying to me that, you know, we're still using such an outdated piece of equipment and I think along the whole spectrum of militaries around the world, air defense is one of those things that really hasn't really gone very far, especially in the Western world. Yes, there's the Patriot weapons platform, yes, there's Stingers, but for the British Army, for sure, we really haven't stepped into the newer world of air defense, and Star Streak is out there. I have talked about the high velocity missile uh, in other videos before that I have done, but uh, I really do feel that Rapier is starting to hit that life cycle where it just needs to go. 2020 is too far away, I really just wish the British Army or the UK military would invest in a better weapons platform. That's not saying Rapier is not good, it's just my opinion. So it's history. Rapier began development in 1961 as a private venture at British Aircraft Corporation, BAC, known as Sightline. The project was to combat supersonic, low-level, high maneuverability craft and pretty much any attempt at sensor guidance in favour of purely optical systems. The operator would keep the telescopic gun sights centred on the target and the automated systems would guide the missile to that point. The optical system ensured high accuracy, so it was developed with the intent of directly hitting its target, reducing the size of the warhead required to guarantee a kill, and eliminating the need for a proximity fuse. As cringy as this may sound, BAC joked that the system was a hitile as opposed to a missile. At the time, the British Army was planning on purchasing the advanced American MIM-46 Mauler system for its air defence needs. When Mauler ran into problems in 1963, the Ministry of Defence issued retirement ET-316 and started funding Sightline as a backup in case Mauler did not deliver. The eventuality came to pass, and ET-316 was completely developed as Rapier, with the first test firings of the missile taking place in 1966. All systems were tested in 1968, which led to production contracts issued in 1969. On parallel track, the RAF Regiment had Tiger Cat developed for it in 1967 from the Sea Cat Naval Surfaced Air Missile System. 
That system was introduced into service with number 48 Squadron RAF Regiment in 1968, giving the RAF Regiment the UK's first fully effective air portable low level SAM system and valuable experience in operating systems of this type. In 1972, a unit known as the Rapier Pilot Battery was formed jointly by No. 63 Squadron RAF Regiment and 9 Plows, the Light Air Defense Battery Royal Artillery. Comprehensive trials ended in 1973 and it was deployed in operational station in Germany in mid-1974. The original Rapier took the form of a wheeled launcher with four missiles, an optical tracker unit, a generator and trailer of stores. The launcher consisted of a large cylindrical unit carrying two missiles on each side, and the surveillance radar dish, otherwise known as the Identification Friend or Foe System or IFF, under a radome on top. The guidance computer and radar electronics were also at the bottom and a prominent parabolic antenna for sending guidance commands to the missiles on the front. The search radar was of the Pulse Doppler type with a range of about 15 kilometers. The aerial located at the top of the launcher rotated about once a second, looking for moving targets that were visible to the Doppler shift radar. Once it was located, a lamp would light up on the selector engagement zone, or SEZ, which was basically a box containing 32 orange lamps arranged in a circle about the size of a steering wheel. The radar operator could also blank out returns from other directions, providing jamming resistance. The optical tracking unit was made up of a stationary lower section and a rotating upper section. The lower section housed the operator controls, while the upper section housed the tracking optics. The operator's optical system was a modified telescope containing a dove prism to prevent the image toppling as the optics rotate in the azimuth. The system meant that unlike a periscope, the operator did not have to move in order to track the target. The upper section also contained a separate missile tracking system that was slave to the operator's optics on his headset based on the television camera optimized for the IR band. Upon detection, the optical tracking system would then be slewed to the target azimuth and the operator would search for the target in elevation. The operator's field of view would depend on the target range, wide at about 20 degrees or track at about 4.8 degrees. When the target was found, the operator switches to track and uses the joystick to keep the target centered in the telescope. Once a steady track was established, the missile was able to be fired. The TV camera on the tracker was tuned to track the four flares on the missile's tail. Guidance updates were sent to the missile through the transmitter on the launcher platform and received on small antennas on the rear of the mid-body fins. The operator simply kept the telescope crosshairs on the target using the joystick and the missile would automatically fly into the line of sight, a system operator known as SACOS. The basic concept is very similar to the ones used by most anti-tank missiles, with the exception that those systems normally use small wires to send guidance information to the missile, rather than the radio link. The missiles contained a small 1.4kg warhead with a contact fuse and a single stage solid rocket motor that accelerated the missile to around 650 meters a second. Engagement time to maximum effective range was around 13 seconds and the response time from the start of target detection to missile launch was around 6 seconds, which has been repeatedly confirmed in live firing. Tracked rapier was something a little different. With sales to Iran came the additional requirement for a mobile version of the rapier. BAC responded by adapting the Rapier system to fit on the M548, a cargo carrier version of the ubiquitous M113 armoured personnel carrier. Development started in 1974 as Tracked Rapier but had not been delivered when the Shah fell from power in 1978. The vehicles were then later purchased by the British Army. The first public showing of the Tracked Rapier was in 1977 at the Paris Air Show as a static display unit. The first track rapiers entered service with 11 Sphinx Air Defense Battery of the 22 Air Defense Regiment Royal Artillery in 1983 in Napier Barracks near Dortmund. The conversion was relatively simple. The launch unit was placed onto the extreme rear of the cargo platform on the rear of the M548 carrier and the track system placed inside the cabin on the front of the vehicle, projecting through the roof of the turret bustles. The optical tracker was operated from the left side of the crew cabin while on the right were the driver and tactical controller. The crew cabin was quite cramped as a result. With the three crew members all the equipment stuffed into the area originally intended for two men, it was extremely cramped. From moving to firing only took around 30 seconds, a tremendous improvement over the towed rapier which required at least a quarter of an hour to unlimber. The biggest difference between the towed and track rapier was that the track rapier launch had eight missile rails compared with the four of the tow system. Unfortunately the equipment was also greatly slowed, with the vehicle being on cross country performance reduced to around 15 kilometers, considering that it is handling very sensitive equipment. There was no room for blind fire on a single M548, so this was instead towed or carried on the M separate 548, feeding data to the control system in the firing unit, thus required more setup time to connect the two vehicles. 
With the less internal hardware, the support vehicle was also tasked with carrying field kits, ration and water. The Rapier system has gone through multiple upgrades since its terms of service when it first started. Firstly, there was laser fire. With the range of upgrades and new components, the original low cost Rapier system was gone. In order to address international market requirements for lower cost systems, BAC started to develop the Rapier Laser Fire in 1982. Laser Fire replaced the original optical track unit with a new LiDAR, or laser radar, illuminating system that was considerably smaller, allowing the entire system to be mounted on a single pallet that could itself be mounted on a truck or flatbed vehicle. There was also the Dark Fire system. In 1985, development started on a new tracker that replaced the original optical tracking system with an IR or infrared thermal imaging system to improve its abilities, especially at night. This version was known as the Rapier Darkfire for this reason. Trials for this system began in 1987 and were actually deployed operationally at 1990, called the Field Standard B2 or FSB2. Of course, there were missile upgrades for this particular platform too. In 1988, tests started on the improved warhead using a proximity fuse in order to give Rapier capability against smaller targets that would be difficult to hit directly, notably high-speed remotely piloted vehicles like UAVs. Serial production of the Mark 1E began in 1989. This missile upgrade was basically a complete redesign of its missile and entered service in the 1990s. Along with a further upgrade of the proximity fuse, the new missile incorporated a then state-of-the-art in technologies, including the Von Karman supersonic aerodynamic profile, composite propellant with a two-stage shape burn and laminated body solid rocket motor, ceramic substrate surface mounted PCBs and completely new electronic systems and software which are extremely important for a weapon system of this kind. The missile warhead is available in two versions, the Mark II Alpha for normal anti-aircraft roll and the Mark II Bravo which includes a shape charge warhead with dual fuses and which was very useful against light armour as well. Rapier 2000 was also brought into this package. In 1992, shortly after the introduction of the Rapier 90, another major upgrade series started by the MBDA emerging as Rapier 2000 or Field Standard C FSC, in British service. Development of the FCS system began in the end of the 1980s and the systems first entered service in 1996. Unfortunately, by this time the Cold War was completely over and British air defence capabilities had really reduced. Fewer and smaller batteries were given these fire units. There was an export version of the weapons platform known as Jurnus and Malaysia was the first to export that particular platform. FSC was effectively a completely new system. The surveillance radar was actually removed from the launcher and became a separate element and each launcher now carried 8 missiles. With missiles increasingly relying on radar guidance since the introduction of blind fire, it made sense to upgrade the original search radar to something more modern. This was supposed to be by Alina Marconi or the Dagger, a 3D pulse Doppler radar with an integrated Corsair Mark 10 IFF system. Dagger is mounted on its own trailer, so the radar on top of the launch unit was no longer needed. In its place, a much more modern optical tracking system was added. The new tracker uses a Sterling Cycle Cooler instead of the compressed gas bottles that are normally used. The use of some much smaller electronics greatly reduced the stack height of the entire launcher, allowing an additional two missiles to be added for a total of eight. In operation, Rapier 2000 is similar to the earlier Blindfire equipped systems. Targets are acquired visually through the Dagger radar and then the Blindfire optical tracker are slewed onto target. The optical system can be used solely to track the missile, or it can be used for all guidance, like the original Rapier. In either case, the engagement is entirely automatic, with no operator guidance needed. The optical system can be used as a search system, seeking out IR sources, allowing radar quiet operation. In 2006, the Ministry of Defence study in a ground-based air defence recommended further reductions based on a reduced air threat and improved air defence capabilities afforded by the beautiful Typhoon fighter jet. These included removing the role from the RF regiment as a measure to preserve the Royal Artillery units in the face of significant cuts to the army. Nevertheless, the Royal Artillery units still placed under command of HQ-1 Group RAF, HQ Command and the Joint Ground Based Air Defence UK was formed. So guys, the Rapier Air Defence System. It's gone through a definite transition phase, you know, we've gone from different types of radar, different types of seekers, different types of uh, amounts of missiles that can be placed on this platform, but overall, it served its purpose well. I mean, in terms of operational deployment, you know, it really hasn't done too much. 
I guess, uh, you know, the Falklands is clearly where this weapon system is used the most. We don't want them coming back across that beautiful island of ours. Uh, so we have these things posted on the coastline. And when I was actually in the Falklands Islands, I was able to go and look at those units, which is really interesting to see. Uh, so the troops out there obviously get to practice using the rapier as much as possible. But they're really impressive bits of kit to see when you actually see them all set up like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in operational deployment, these things really aren't needed. There's just not. There's no real air risk for the British Army at the moment. Um, from an engineering perspective, the fragile nature of the FSA launchers was very well known um, before the conflict when it came to, you know, uh, the Falkland Islands. So, and it's still to this day a very delicate weapon system. It's something that's very fragile and needs to be looked after. So it's not something that, you know, like the track rape here where it can drive long and bob up and down all over the place. This thing's really got to be set stationary. And I think that is one of its weaknesses. You know, it's not an air defense platform that is highly mobile. It needs to be stationary, which is fine. But I think it's time for if the UK really wants to up upgrade its air defense weapons platforms to really go on the mobile strength you know not these emplacements that take a bit of time to set up because they're just not practical in terms of modern day conflict there is no static battlefield anymore like they used to be you know in the cold war days where we would set up our defensive lines and hope they would come towards us it's not quite like that anymore but really i don't think it's on the top priority for the uk military to be worrying about air defense it's really not i mean the last time these things were utilized was for the olympic games and nothing really showed up those days so you know they pretty much get mothballed back to the falkland islands for again not gonna get used i hope they don't anyway anyway folks that's it for today, the Rapier Missile System. Hope you enjoyed it, please leave me a like and a comment, let me know what you think of the Rapier Weapons platform and maybe you agree, maybe you think it does need replacing or maybe you feel that this really is a formidable platform that can continue lasting through the ages so to speak. Um, guys if you do want to support my channel I'd really appreciate you go check out my Patreon account. Uh, unfortunately nearly all of my videos on YouTube are becoming demonetized due to the military nature so it is a little disheartening to see that happening so if you do want to support me you can either check out my Patreon or even even look at the PayPal description below. Of course, if you do wish to make a donation to support my channel, it is wholeheartedly appreciated and thank you very much in advance and for those who have in the past. Hope you enjoyed today's video guys, have a wonderful day, all the best and bye bye.